Hey guys, welcome to iGaming. Today I will be playing Gerda A Flame in Winter, the full game with no commentary. It's gonna be an awesome game and sad as well. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I will leave you to enjoy the full game right now. Hjemlængsel tager mit hjerte i sin varme hånd. Sødmefuld er min smerte kvæt i savnet hånd. Og når det så bliver aften, går jeg til hjemmegnen hen. Just som den gang jeg traf den, Fylder glæden mit sind Er du træt, trist og tvær Rejs mod dem, som du har kær Der skal vor kolde hjerter Varmes i hjemmegnen skær
But war did come. Only a few months later, on April 9th, 1940, German forces crossed the Danish border. In towns like ours, German only a generation before, the occupiers were received warmly, in other towns with hostility. Within two hours, the government capitulated. Within four, the fighting stopped. The king gave a speech, urging calm and cooperation to avoid needless bloodshed. Most of us listened. For years, life moved along normally, if a bit uncertain. And some of us delayed our lives, waiting for the war to end. Only a few upstarts, mostly communists and young students, made trouble for the Germans with limited public support. But then, in 1943, the winds of war blew in from the east and German supremacy no longer seemed assured. Then more Danes began to rise up and the occupation became more violent. The Germans disbanded the Danish military, took over our police and began shooting those who rose against them. But 
Neither side had clean hands. The resistance executed informants, snitches and collaborators. Danes fought against Danes. In our little rural hamlet, the soldiers came. The Gestapo came. The war bared its bloody fangs. Abroad, German lines were collapsing, their forces folding under Allied advance. But our town was a powder keg ready to explode. We knew the war would be over soon. We only had to keep our heads down a little longer.
When the war came to Denmark, we were not forced out of our homes, and soldiers did not point their guns at us, but scarcity made itself known. Our lives became more muted, and our indulgences became more and more modest, until a pinch of sugar became a luxury. Still, we had a livelihood, and the simple pleasures of life remained to us, perhaps painted stronger than ever before. The Nazis had arrived under the guise of friendship, but it didn't take a genius to see how fragile that mask was.
I'm a little earlier than usual, but I'm sure the doctor won't mind. There are always patients who come knocking as soon as the cock crows. Thank you. 
For all the talk of war and all the soldiers parading through the streets, it had been a long time since we felt the bloody sting of violence in our little tingler. Most days at the clinic consisted of the odd fever, a bout of indigestion, or perhaps a sprained wrist from a child playing in the snow. This was the first time I had ever treated someone for a violent ban, and a soldier at that. I hoped it would be the last. How many more people would have to suffer before this war was finally over? I need a few things from the market. Perhaps Margaret will be there. I'm curious to know what she thinks of today's events.
Before the war began, even the markets in Little Tinglev were filled with gadgets from abroad, strange and wonderful fruits, and all manner of comforts which we took for granted. And then, in a flash, we entered an era of scarcity, and the luxuries vanished. Tinglev's market hung on by a thread, and the weekly shopping became an exercise in strained optimism and bursts of culinary improvisation. If I wanted to obtain the occasional luxury, I had to make some moral compromises. It was a price I was willing to pay. The windows are shining like beacons in the darkness. Did Anders forget to put up the blackout curtains again?
In an instant, the peaceful life that Anders and I had strived to protect was gone. The rooms in our home seemed emptier without him. The wind outside blew colder, and the creak of the floorboards became a reminder of both his absence and the threat that had swept through our sanctuary. I shivered as I sat at my desk, unable to clean up the disarray that the Gestapo had left behind. To my surprise, I felt a swell of pride seeing my gentle Anders take a stand, even if it might cost us everything. Criminal Inspector Stahl wants to ask me some questions, and I need to know why Anders was arrested.
They put on friendly faces. They smile at you when you walk down the street. They hold doors open and make space under their umbrellas. But behind it all, there's a quiet menace. All their niceties mask a sinister motive. Their eyes cannot help but scan and study you. They look for weaknesses, which can be exploited. And you shiver under the gaze of the Gestapo, no matter what promises they make. I could only imagine what it had been like for Anders, under their gaze, for so long. According to Anders, this is where the Sparrow and the others are hiding. I hope I can get some answers out of them. Stahl told me I might be able to see Anders if I return. I know he cannot be trusted, but what choice do I have? In his letter, Anders mentioned that he was taking care of some ducklings near the lake. I wonder what he really meant.
They looked so terrified, crammed together in that little hut. The child had the eyes of a mouse, and her mother the eyes of a feral cat. It was only when Jacob arrived, and her shoulders relaxed, that I saw how tired Esther truly was. How long had they wandered from one hiding place to another? Always moments from discovery. How alone must they have felt, unsure if every off at hand held a hidden blade? Jacob is so often timid and afraid. He must have cared a great deal to help these two.
According to Anders, this is where the Sparrow and the others are hiding. I hope I can get some answers out of them. Thank you. 
When I heard the word resistance, I'd imagined brave fighters and a vast underground force organizing against the Nazis. I didn't expect to find two strangers and an old friend huddled together in a drafty hunter's lodge. Their presence confirmed Anders' involvement. It proved that he had hidden a whole second life from me, a life that had gotten a soldier wounded and brought one of his own comrades near death. It seemed Leva would only trust me once I offered her some help. Apparently it didn't matter that my husband had been one of her closest confidants. Stahl told me I might be able to see Anders if I return. I know he cannot be trusted, but what choice do I have?
It had only been one day, but already Anders looked like a different man. The bruises on his face spoke volumes of the Gestapo, and his tired eyes betrayed the restless night he had spent inside that cell. I wondered how long he could endure such hardships, and how far I would go to prevent them. Oh, my poor Anders. to act quickly to secure his release. The pastor is bringing Esther and her daughter here this afternoon. Maybe they need some more help. The resistance group is moving to their new hideout this afternoon. They might appreciate any help I can offer.
It seemed that Midas Inn had become a refuge for those hiding from the occupation, albeit a costly one. They all had a common enemy, but uncommon goals. Some pushed for action, others for escape, but they shared a desire to remain hidden, even as German soldiers and sympathizers drank beer just one room away. How could anyone relax in a place like that? Mida and Nis were making a tidy sum from their guests. For them, this was an opportunity to profit instead of helping those in need. I believe I'm betraying the doctor like this. But if I'm to see Anders again, I'll need to break in and steal the penicillin. There's something up ahead.
For years, the clinic had been a reminder of the years I spent away from Tinglev, when my skills and expertise as a healer were honed in the city. Here, at least, I was indispensable and valued. Even Harold, in his own begrudging way, had come to rely on me. It was a place that represented my independence, and in one single night, I put all that at risk and betrayed my duty as a nurse. I needed to remind myself that no matter what happened, I had done this for Anders. The darkness around me feels suffocating, but I'll finally get to see Anders again. I hope what I did was worth it. It has to be.
The Gestapo headquarters felt oppressive in the dim moonlight. I had passed by this building many times on my way into town, never paying much attention to the old police station, but something about the new occupants transformed it. It suddenly seemed to be mocking me, instilling fear. Was this the only place where I would be able to speak to my husband from now on? Anders must have been sloppy to get himself trapped in a place like this. I would have to do something to make up for his mistakes. Pastor Jacob will be presiding over the Sunday service. I need to catch him alone and ask him about Mr. Vestergaard.
Looking at the congregation, I couldn't help but see our little town's fraught past. The effects of changing hands between nations lasting for generations. The gravestones at the church, including my family's, attested to this history. In better times, our differences and the injustices of the past were forgotten over Sunday cake. But now, they smolder just below the surface, ready to combust. Both Germans and Danes were just trying to live their lives, and I hoped that they could stop their differences from dividing them. Reinhard has offered to look after Anders if I help him with something. I wonder what it could be. The soldiers and workers here might be willing to tell me something about Mr. Vestergaard. What sort of secrets is he hiding? The resistance could be valuable allies in helping to save Anders. I should see if they need any help. The soldiers and... Thank you. 
Thank you. 
This factory had come to represent so much to so many. To its workers, it was employment and security. To Nazi sympathizers, it was a testament to the value of cooperation. And to the resistance, it was a monument to greed and corruption. The bricks had taken on meaning, and their destruction was a direct response to that meaning. If there was any truth to be found here, I hope to find it. I had scoured the area for clues, but something told me that there was much more to be found here. Collaboration was a messy business. Reinhardt has offered to look after Anders if I help him with something. I wonder what it could be. The Resistance could be valuable allies in helping to save Anders. I should see if they... I should visit Margit. Maybe she can reveal what her father is up to. Or I could find out something on my... I've been told that Leva will be carrying out a mission here today. If I go and help her, she might come to trust me more. I should visit Mark.
The Vestergaard Manor was a testament to one man's ambition, and it seeped through every corner of the building. Even when he was gone, his presence dominated the rooms. I had hoped to find something incriminating, but there was no clear evidence to be had. Only vague indications that riled my curiosity and threatened to strain my friendship with Margit. Vestergaard didn't seem to be a monster, but that didn't mean he lacked skeletons in his closet. Perhaps these could be used to pressure him. Reinhard has offered to look after Anders if I... Their assistance could be valuable allies in helping to save Anders. I should see if they need... I've been told that Leva will be carrying out a mission here today. If I go and help her, she might come to trust me more. Reinhard has offered to look after Anders. Their assistance could be valuable allies in helping to save Anders. I should see if they need... Reinhard...
Thank you. 
They danced around the system, skirting guards and checkpoints, making papers disappear and reappear as needed. They moved vast quantities of goods throughout the country, but along the way they hurt people and endangered lives. Reinhardt was eager to work with these smugglers from the north because he knew what they could offer, and I, in turn, knew what he could offer me. Was it worth the price? Working with these men meant supporting a system that hurt people and made goods harder to come by. Such exploitation would weigh heavily on me. I need to convince Mr. Vestergaard to help free Anders. If he won't offer aid, then who can I turn to? I need... There's something up ahead. There's something up ahead.
How strange it was to see such opulence after so many years of scarcity. Vestergaard had gone to great lengths to display his power and furnish the banquet with as much food and drink as the black market would allow. But his wealth fueled his power. He wasn't willing to do anything which would put that wealth at risk. I would have to save Anders on my own. I had hoped guilt would drive him to do the right thing, but it seemed his conscience was not as troubled as mine. My head is spinning, but I have to try and get some rest. There are so many things that I need to do tomorrow.
It seemed that the events of the last few days were affecting me in ways I didn't realize. My mind was racing after the choices I'd made, turning over every decision and wondering at its effects. I could feel myself changing, doing things I'd never imagined, and consorting with people I would normally avoid. Was this the person I wanted to be? If changing myself was what it would take to save Anders, then that is what I would have to do. Torben is heading west to get forged papers for Esther. Perhaps I can help ensure that my father is friends with some of the guards at the factory. I could try to persuade him to tell me about their routines. The resistance is keeping Heinrich captive here. The boy's a bit of a sleuth. He might know something about the factory. Reinhard is lurking around the market. If I help him with his schemes, he might be more helpful when I try to break into the factory. Torben is heading west. My father is friends with some of the guards at the factory. I My father...
My father had been an honest and hardworking man, but fate did not smile on his ambitions. In spite of the love and support from my mother and I, something in him was not satisfied. When the Nazis came, promising German pride, purpose and heritage, he readily joined his relatives to sing their praises, but it cost him more than he realized. Our family fractured. I wasn't sure I could trust him. He had chosen a vile ideology, and even if he was my father, a person like that could not be trusted.
Reinhard is lurking around the market. The resistance is keeping Heinrich captive here. Torben is heading west to get forged papers for Esther. Perhaps...
The cold wind on the outskirts of our parish stung my face almost as much as my guilt. If I wanted to help the people I cared about, others would suffer. There wasn't enough to go around. Not enough papers, not enough medicine, not enough time. And the soldiers, with their desperation and anger, only made things worse. Would someone always have to get hurt along the way? There would never be enough for everyone. At least I knew the people I cared about were worth saving. I could only guess about the others. To free Anders, I need to help either the Resistance or Reinhardt break into the factory and acquire munitions. But who would be my best ally? There's something up ahead.
It was strange to see the factory at night. So quiet, and with a fresh wound still marring the brickwork. It was even stranger to find so many tools of destruction in this place that had been meant to build things. The explosives were a valuable asset, one that could help liberate Anders from his captors. But they would also cause harm. How much destruction was justified to save one man? My desire to save Anders was blinding me to all the people getting hurt along the way. Would they haunt me when this was over? with patrols. I told the others to bring the munitions here. We must hide until things quiet down.
We scurried through the night, avoiding German patrols, and found refuge inside the church. It was strange to find myself in that place with these particular companions. For all of their fighting prowess, they were just as vulnerable as me in this moment, shivering against the cold stone of our sanctuary. I could barely imagine how the countless refugees in this war had made do night after night.
My heart ached for Esther. How long had she and Sophia moved from haven to haven, never getting a proper chance to rest? Peter will be busy preparing for tonight's mission. I'm sure he wishes to save Anders, but perhaps I need to make sure that we're on the same page. Mr. Vestergaard says he has no power over the Gestapo, but surely he or Margit can somehow help me break Anders out at the station. Esther is trying to escape by train towards Sweden. She might need my help to get past the new checkpoints in town. Mr. Vestergaard.
The war brought out the best in some, and the worst in others. Vestergaard had always been ambitious, but his greed pushed him further and further into collaboration, 
It's true that he directed some of his wealth and power towards helping those in need, even towards the resistance. But were these token gestures enough to make up for the harm he'd done? Was I wrong to accept his help? There is no easy morality in war. Everyone gets their hands dirty. But we must do what we can to keep the dead from spreading too far. Reinhardt is finishing his deal with the smugglers from Copenhagen. If I assist him, he may be more inclined to help me rescue Anders. Esther is trying to escape by train towards Sweden. She might need my help to get past the new checkpoints in town. Peter will be busy preparing for tonight's mission. I'm sure he wishes to save Anders, but perhaps I need to make sure that we're on the same page. Reinhardt is...
When I looked at the alleys and shops of Tinglev Market, I no longer saw the quaint village square I'd once known. Memories of smugglers, angry crowds and shifty soldiers polluted every corner. They had robbed the place of its provincial charm, but I wasn't innocent either. The memories stuck to me like tar. Had I made the right choice, helping these greed-stricken men despite the cost? There will always be greed in the world. We can never truly avoid it. But helping it along too eagerly is still a sin. The steam from the train rises in the horizon. If I falter now, Anders might be taken away from me forever.
And just like that, it all ended. I ran and ran, but running only moves you forward. It cannot change the past. Eventually, a pair of local farmers took me in and hit me from the Nazis. The shock of Anders' death filled my waking hours. I had been so close to saving him. I kept thinking about how we had planned our future together and how our dreams had been snuffed out in an instant. If only I had more time. If I had just done things differently. Could he still be here with me? Months passed, and on the 4th of May, Denmark was liberated from its German occupiers. But the war did not end quietly like I had hoped. There was a maelstrom of activity as Nazi collaborators were put into camps, snitches were executed by the resistance, and others were put on trial for treason. But in time, life began to return to its familiar patterns. I went back home. The house had been searched, though it was otherwise as Anders and I had left it. Once I had cleared away the mess, it almost felt like no time had passed at all, like it was all a bad dream. But in all the nooks and crannies, the ghosts of the past were waiting for me to let down my guard, lest I forgot what happened and who I had lost. I saw Leva at the train station the other day. She was handing out pamphlets with a pair of young revolutionaries on her heels. She was a hero to them, both for her actions during the war and the organizing she had undertaken since. When she caught me staring, she smiled awkwardly, then looked away. Perhaps she was sorry for involving me in her plans and for the people who were hurt by our actions. But none of this stopped her from promoting her cause. I wonder if she will ever succeed. After he escaped from the train station, Peter had seemingly vanished into thin air. I often found myself wondering what had happened to him, until one day I heard a torrent of profanity from behind me. I couldn't help but smile as I turned to see Peter, haggard but alive. He had returned to Tinglev and was moving a load of car parts to his auto shop. You would have thought the tools had been Nazis from the way he swore while fumbling with them. Stahl died on that dark winter's night, defending a system which was collapsing around him. His ideology made him lash out with violence. I cannot understand how a person comes to be that way, but I must believe that future generations will learn from this horrible war so that its mistakes are not repeated. How could anyone ever forget such dark years? To me, Wolfgang always seemed like he was from a different time. It's probably what attracted Margit. But despite his knightly ideals, he didn't get to join his comrades and die a noble warrior's death at the front. Instead, he died in a flurry of confusion. Deep down, I felt that he was more driven by tradition than hate. But it's a pity that he chose to serve such a vile empire. I hope that Margit can recover from the loss. She only saw the best in him. My hand shakes as I write these words, unable to contain my sorrow. Esther and Sophia's bodies have been identified at the Neuengamme concentration camp, though details of their deaths are sparse. Were they at least together? Or did little Sophia die alone and afraid, while her helpless mother perished in some distant cell? They were so close to escape. Could I have done more for them than I did? I overheard my German neighbor gossiping to her friend about Reinhard. Apparently, he deserted just before the end of the war and boarded a freighter bound for South America. I cannot help but wonder what will become of him so far across the sea. And I cannot help but wonder why he acted as he did when stationed in Tinglev. Was he running from something even then? Or has he always been reckless and impulsive with no concern for who he hurts? 
If he's really gone so far away as the rumors say, I suppose I'll never know. Olgert Vestergaard requested a house call today. He was complaining about chest pains, but his heart sounded perfectly healthy. I think his pain stems from something entirely different. Something that gigantic fortune of his can never cure. This Friday, the city council is hosting a banquet to honor his efforts to assist the resistance. It's as though everyone has forgotten the fortune he made supplying the Nazis. Can a few token gestures really restore a man's reputation so easily? I miss Margaret. All I have now is our correspondence. She cut all ties with her father and moved up north to Randus. It seems like the big city suits her, and she even writes short stories for a local magazine. Her stories are tinged with melancholy, but I'm happy to see her doing so well. I talked to the pastor at church this Sunday. He expressed sadness about fewer people showing up for church and even fewer staying for coffee after. Neither the Danes nor the Germans seem to be able to stand being in the same room together. I tried convincing him to show patience. The town needs more time to heal. I saw Charlotte at the market today. The other villagers acted like she wasn't there and she could barely get the attention of the merchants. I couldn't bring myself to speak with someone who had worked so closely with the occupation. At least not yet. I walked to the other side of the square, but I think she saw me. The next time I spotted her, she was leaving the market, her bag only half full. I visited the inn last Thursday. Mida was there, standing behind the bar and looking like her usual self. She keeps busy, serving beer and bantering with the locals. But every so often, I catch her staring blankly at the walls. These spells never last for long, but it seems her time inside the camps has left a mark. I wonder how long it will linger. For some people, the scars might remain forever. The clinic was boarded up after Harold's death, and I was forced to start making house calls on my bicycle. The town council put out an advertisement looking for a new doctor to take over the clinic. I wonder if the new owner will be German or Danish, and which the town would prefer. After the war, Papa was interned at the Fohus camp, along with many other fathers in the German minority who had volunteered to help the occupiers. I only mustered the courage to visit him once. It was hard to see him so frail within the confines of that camp, but I couldn't forget his ties to the ideology that had torn apart our town. We have so little to say to each other now. Our sleepy little town had been ripped apart by the war, and even my hands, the hands of a nurse, were not entirely free of blood. Like so many others, I had acted in self-interest, seeking safety for myself and my loved ones. But the gains I made came at a great cost to our community. Death had visited Tinglev and left its mark. How long would it take for the wounds of war to heal.
Bye. 